Thunderbirds Are Go was released in 1966 and saw the puppet stars of Jerry Anderson's smash hit television series Thunderbirds make the giant leap onto the big screen for the first of two feature films. Thunderbirds Are Go! Written by the Andersons themselves and directed by David Lane, the film follows the Tracy family of International Rescue as they provide security for the launch of Zero X, a mammoth spacecraft that will carry mankind to Mars for the very first time. Despite the very best efforts of the Hood to sabotage the project, Zero X successfully makes it to the Red Planet. I've always been fascinated by that phrase, life as we know it. I have a feeling that we may encounter life as we don't know it. Where the crew encounters alien life in the form of the deadly rock snakes. Six weeks later, disaster strikes again as Zero X re-enters Earth's atmosphere, and International Rescue must once more spring into action as they race to rescue the crew before the ship crash lands. They have an escape unit failure. Unless we can get the crew and passengers out before that aircraft hits the ground, they are all doomed men. Thunderbirds Are Go was actually announced to the press before the first episode of the series had even aired, and the subsequent runaway success of the television show almost guaranteed that the film would be a surefire box office smash. Don't let your imagination run riot. With a second season of the television series also being produced alongside the film, a drastic expansion of the AP film studio machine would be required to handle the extra workload, and the company purchased two more buildings on the Slough Trading Estate bringing their total to five. There are five. In particular, much time was spent preparing the puppets and rebuilding sets and vehicles to ensure that they would stand up to scrutiny when projected onto a large cinema screen. As a result, many of the shots of the puppets are framed to avoid showing their wires, and on the rare occasion any of them actually walk in this film, their legs are kept firmly out of shot. Yes, sir. This increased attention to detail also came with a greater realism when it came to the film's guest vehicle, the Zero X, and many of its sets. What a magnificent sight! The Glenfield Control Tower set and the two-color SEC conference room set look like something out of a Bond film, while Alan's dream sequence halfway through the movie delivers a little bit of Hollywood glitz and glamour, even if it is largely unnecessary. Sorry, Dad. The film would also feature an expansion of the regular Thunderbirds voice cast, mostly to provide the voices of the Zero X crew, and several of these actors would return in future Anderson productions. Most notably, the film and the second season of the television show marked the point at which Jeremy Wilkin took over the role of Virgil Tracy from David Holliday. Are you game? I sure am. In previous series, it wasn't unusual for a puppet character's design to be modelled on a celebrity, but Thunderbirds Are Go would take that one step further in the form of the dream sequence midway through the film that saw Lady Penelope and Alan travel to futuristic nightclub The Swinging Star. There they would encounter the film's real-life guest stars... None other than Cliff Richard Jr. And The Shadows Jr. What a terrific group. Yes, they always play at the swinging star. You see, they're way out. Cliff and the Shadows would also contribute to the film's soundtrack, and the group even recorded footage to help the puppeteers more precisely mimic their distinctive movements. That's enough. Okay, thank you. Thanks to the film's budget of at least £250,000, Barry Gray would also enjoy the luxury of a 70-piece orchestra to record the film's score, which would include one of the most popular pieces of music he would ever compose, the Zero X theme. Since the departure of Arthur Provis, whose surname had provided the P in AP Films, the company's original name had seemed more and more like a holdover from a bygone age, and now it was time to find a name that better reflected their output. This is a tough one. Although the film would be released through United Artists, it would also be the first Anderson production to open with the iconic Century 21 sting that would remain in use until the end of UFO. Now, on the big screen, in Technicolor and Technoscope, a brand new adventure that takes you where you've never been before. Thunderbirds are gold. 
By the time Thunderbirds Are Go finally hit the big screen, the television series that spawned it had already been cancelled after a second season of just six episodes. There was no violence, he just held me at gunpoint, tied me up and locked me in the missile store. After failing to secure a US network deal, Lou Grade felt that it would be easier to sell a brand new show than further episodes of an existing one, and Thunderbirds on television came to an end. I don't think there's much point in looking for survivors, Parker. No, my lady. However, the Century 21 team was still hopeful that this might not be as ominous as it first appeared. And when Thunderbirds Are Go was premiered at London's Pavilion Cinema on December 12th, 1966, it seemed certain that they had a box office sensation on their hands. Gee, have some more champagne. Perhaps Thunderbirds wasn't dead after all. Perhaps the new film would just be the first in a long line of successful Thunderbirds movies that could even rival the James Bond franchise. What goes on around here? Have you all gone crazy? The film's failure took everyone by surprise, even United Artists, who would soon take the unprecedented step of inviting Century 21 to begin work on a sequel, Thunderbirds 6. But that's another story. I can't possibly make it. Don't tell me. You're afraid. Thunderbirds Argo received a mixed response from critics and fans alike when it was first released, and continues to do so to this day. I have 862 pages here, sir, which say just that. The film represents a superb technical achievement and delivers some of the most visually stunning moments of any Jerry Anderson production, but perhaps too much time is spent on the hardware. I'm afraid I can't answer that question. The film's biggest weakness is in forgetting that viewers had come to love the characters of the Tracy family just as much as the machines they piloted, but most of them are poorly served by this film. As far as we're concerned, the only good publicity is no publicity. International Rescue don't even appear for the first 20 minutes, and aren't really properly needed until the final act, as any halfway competent security force could easily fulfil the role they play in the first half. Yes sir, Colonel Sir. Scott and Virgil have very little to do compared to their usual roles on television. What about me, father? Well, it's unlikely that you'll be needed. While Brains, Tintin and Gordon each only get a few lines. Sorry, Tintin. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Tracy, I understand. Well, I don't. Instead, perhaps believing him to be the most relatable of the Tracy brothers among younger viewers, the film very heavily pushes Alan as the main character at the expense of almost everyone else. To Alan, the hero of the day. He gets to star in his own dream sequence midway through the movie, and the film even concludes with everyone praising him for saving the Zero X crew, even though he mostly just copied what Gordon did to save the Fire Flash back in Operation Crash Dive. Here I go again! The film's release was accompanied by a novelization and a four-part picture story in the TV Century 21 comic, which was soon followed up by a long-running Zero X comic strip telling the further adventures of Captain Paul Travers and his crew. The only thing we really want to say is, thanks. Over on the small screen, Captain Scarlet and the Mysterons debuted in September 1967, opening with a scene in which Captain Black of Spectrum discovers the Mysteron city while exploring Mars in a Zero X MEV. This would be a rare attempt by Century 21 to cross an element of one Anderson series over into another, although such crossovers frequently occurred in the pages of TV 21. Since the Zero X mission to Mars, there have been a number of peculiar happenings. But ironically, Zero X itself rather hinders the idea of a shared continuity between the television shows. Because if all the Super Marionation series are taking place in the same universe, then how come the human race of Fireball XL5 has established bases and space stations throughout the universe, but never thought to go to Mars until this film. We're missing something. I know we're missing something. Thunderbirds Are Go represented something of a turning point in Jerry Anderson's career. Following the film's failure and the cancellation of the Thunderbirds television series, his Supermarionation empire would struggle to maintain cohesion without another smash hit to sustain it, and ultimately disintegrated in 1969. As a film in its own right though, Thunderbirds Argo can perhaps be best described as a flawed gem. 
the heck are you talking about? Its achievements are still hugely impressive more than 50 years after its release, and it remains a marvellous showcase for the work of the many talented people who made it. And may I add my thanks and congratulations too. Despite its flaws, the film remains a triumph for Anderson and his team, and for many fans, Thunderbirds are Go represents the very pinnacle of the golden age of Super Mario Nation. F-A-P. A shooting star will shoot you, and Mars will go to war. The man in the moon will jump on you if you don't love me no more.